Well, good morning and welcome to today's Crop Hour. We've successfully made it to the last week of Crop Hours, and today is our last Crop Hour for the 2022 winter season. Um, with that, I just want to do a little bit of housekeeping. If you have any questions throughout today's presentation, please utilize the chat or that Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. You know, drop those questions in there and we'll be sure to get them addressed throughout today's webinar session. And then at the conclusion of the presentation, there'll be a quick two question poll that I ask that you fill out, which will help in creating other materials. And then please look for uh, a survey at the end of the week that will be emailed to you really evaluating the crop hour program. That way it will help us create new series or in-person meetings and that sort of educational material for everyone. Um, with that, just wanna say that my name is Connie Strunk. I'm a plant pathology field specialist with SDSU Extension and I'll be your moderator today. And I have the privilege of introducing and welcoming you all to our um, crop hour session and introducing our speakers for today. Our speakers today are Dr. Matt Dearson and Anthony Bly. Mr. Dearson is our economics specialist up at SDSU and Anthony serves as our soils field specialist in Sioux Falls. They bring a wealth of knowledge and experience to this area. And so with that, I'm just gonna turn it over to them before I really show my lack of knowledge in some of this area. Thanks, Connie. I'll share my screen here. Hmm. So when I wanna share my screen, I've got four versions up there. I'm gonna take this one. Does that work for everybody? Go to that display settings. Okay. And swap again? Yep. How about that? Wonderful. Isn't that something? Okay. Well, yes. Thank you, Connie. Um, uh, Dr. Dearson is here. Uh, uh, I, you know, we've, I'm going to do the bulk of the presenting today. If you have any specific ec economic questions, uh, uh, we have him here to answer those questions. And um, I'm sure Connie and Sarah and, and uh, others will be monitoring the chat um, for questions. And we'll, we'll just go over that as we continue. So precision profitability analysis and carbon conservation. Um, this, this presentation I'm going to share with you has had many different titles and, um, uh, this is the one we came up for, for this week. And, uh, um, I think, I think the carbon is on a lot of people's minds. I'm not going to get into that too heavily, but, uh, at the end, we'll talk about that a little bit, um, before I proceed any further, uh, I want to acknowledge our other author, uh, Kristen Weber. Uh, she is our precision ag and conservation specialist. She uh, works with uh, Pheasants Forever through a partnership with SDSU. And so I just wanted to acknowledge her, acknowledge her but you will meet her in a few slides here. So really um, that title is, is, is well and good, but it's really about the Every Acre Counts concept and, and program. And uh, our byline there for Every Acre Counts is production practices for greater profitability. Um, that is uh, the precision profitability analysis in itself. So, you know, we have a really great photo here of a South Dakota landscape. Um, and in, in essence, it shows what, what we are after. Um, we kind of gone away from um, thinking about land management as um, highest and best use. Um, we've got gotten into, uh, you know, production systems that focus on the last bushel or every square inch, and that's not a stretch, but at least every square foot of every field to farm, to grow crop. And so this program, uh, you know, at a high, very high level seeks to, uh, question that paradigm and to show that, 
uh, profitability on all areas of all fields is, 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 you know, uh, not good. In fact, it's in the red in some, some areas of our fields. So this shows the epitome of what we're trying here. We have marginal lands on the left side of that photo and we have cropland on the right side and the two can coexist on, on, on every farm. So our, our initial primary partners in this project were the second Century Habitat Fund, a fund created by uh, Governor Dugard, um, uh, solely working on, on habitat issues. Uh, USDA NRCS um, has, has been a major uh, funding supporter, and then SDSU Extension. We're, uh, we're conducting the program. Um, you know, we're really the great mediator, uh, if you will, in, in, in the state. We work with all stakeholder groups um, in agriculture. And so it was a great place for a project like this to really rest. Uh, again, you know us, there we are. I put this up here for the benefit of those that, that, that don't know us as well. And, and so you can easily contact us. Uh, this is Kristen Weber. As I mentioned, her position is cooperatively shared between Pheasants Forever and SDSU. And uh, that's been enabled by uh, several grants, uh, mainly from Perina Pet Care and uh, USDA NRCS. And we are just so happy to have Kristen on our team. She makes the software and all the analysis tools just sing. And uh, she's very good at what she does. Um, you know, we have some really lofty goals and outcomes for the project. And while I could very boringly read to you uh, this goal and outcome, I'm going to just summarize it very succinctly. And really what it means is precision profitability analysis identifies marginal field areas. That, that's our goal, uh, to empower farmers to use their data and their own economic input records uh, to to identify these marginal field areas. And, and that's very empowering. And what we'd really expect in the end is that uh, producers would be convinced, producers and landowners would be convinced that removing these marginal lands uh, from crop production is, is really profitable and increases their profitability. That, that's, that's the outcome um, that, that we really want to have. And um, I think that's the initial steps of cha changing the paradigm, the paradigm of the current land management focus that we have. So what uh, are some of our marginal lands? I just want to discuss this briefly in a few slides. Um, first of all, we have these alkali spots, uh, salty soils um, showing up, uh, mainly up and down the Jim River Valley, if you will. Um, my son keeps ask, asking me, where's the valley? Where's the valley? And, you know, that's a very good question because you, you really can't see a valley. <laughs> and, um, but it's the area, you know, extensively on both sides of, of the James River. Um, there are some pockets in that area that have more salt issues than others, but we're seeing those develop up and down that area. Um, that area is the last kind of geologic um, area affected by our glaciers. And so um, because of higher precipitation um, and uh, change in farming practices, we're getting these salts that are coming up from the sub material or the subsoil and, and being um, well, they're essentially deposited at the soil surface because the water, the excess water is evaporating. So we're getting a lot of these, uh, these spots developing. Um, of course, soybeans uh, don't like these salty areas. Uh, corn is somewhat more tolerant, wheat somewhat more tolerant than that. And barley probably is um, the agronomic crop we can recognize more, more easily that, that, uh, that is, you know, more tolerant to these salty areas. So um, there's a good picture of that. We've even have uh, evidence, uh, visuals of these salty areas that are blowing in the wind. Uh, what happens to that soil surface is it's, uh, 
becomes dispersed. There's no structure or anything to hold the particles together. And the wind just easily picks, picks up uh, that, uh, that salt and other, and other sand, silt, and clay particles, and, and, and they blow. Uh, so here's, here's a good picture of fixing a salty soil uh, on the left side there, obviously, uh, where some species of uh, grass, perennial grasses, were planted that were tolerant to that salt um, and eventually uh, uh, move, help move that salt back down in the soil profile. And then um, less tolerant species of grass can fill in and take over. And so uh, that, that's a really good pictorial of, of, of what can be done uh, with, with perennials. Oops, clicked on the wrong thing. There we go. Okay, another example of uh, marginal lands are eroded hillsides. Um, this is a swale in that topo sequence, but on the left and right of that, swale or drainage way, you can see um, uh, lighter colored uh, areas, uh, which are evidence of erosion. And, and in far in the background, way off in the horizon, you can see a pattern of light and dark soils as well, kind of way out there by that tree grove. And so erosion is happening. Um, I'm not here to talk about- uh, Anthony, your slides stop sharing. Yeah. They did. Oh my. You clicked back and it didn't come back on. How about now? No. Oh boy. How do I get off of this? No, it's your whole screen. So if you do slideshow. If I do slideshow, <laughs> it should work, huh? There? Yep. Okay, we'll go. We'll go ahead to where I was. Right here. Right there. Yep. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so, uh, yeah. So erosion is happening and um, those could be marginal lands as well. Um, just an example of a eroded hillside with, with a waterway that's been taken out. And we can see the erosion that's happening down through once where that waterway was, uh, was installed. And, um, you know, um, I'm not going to uh, be critical of glyphosate programs, but, you know, we all saw those waterways disappear uh, when glyphosate uh, kind of came on the scene and uh, had to do with uh, our spraying technology, and now we have sprayers that are controlled at each nozzle. And so I see an opportunity to bring some of these waterways back. Our marginal wetlands are also an example of, uh, of, 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 uh, um, of an area that could be reduced in productivity. Um, um, of course, there's a lot of talk about tile drainage and, and, and used as a tool, and it's a valid tool, but uh, it really takes a, 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 a good situation for tile drainage to work. And, and there's poss there's, I know there's areas that, that are still going to remain wet, and so those would be good examples of marginal areas. Uh, of course, here's just a little more extreme version of that. Um, you know, more frequently f flooded in the last few years. Um, you know, I think everyone has noticed that and the frequency of higher precipitation events are all, are all more common today. So how are we going to go about this? Um, of course, we need producers and as cooperators to work with. Of course, we're going to get their records. Um, we can even work with variable uh, rate fertilizer and seed and put those costs in. Um, of course, we use precision profitability software to do this. Um, we're also going to work with producers on practices that they may, may be most suited for them and programs most suited for them. Um, after it's all said and done, we, we'd like to assess the profitability with and without those marginal lands converted. Um, you know, as I mentioned, determine programs that are right for their farm could be CRP 
could be pheasants forever ship uh, SHHP, uh, could be every acre counts itself. We really don't care uh, what program it is. Uh, you know, we don't, we don't have blinders on and you got to absolutely work with the every acre counts program. That's not our goal. Our goal is to identify profitability across the landscape and to help farmers make decisions on, on, on better ways to, to manage, manage their fields. And of course, you know, number seven is really where SDSU comes in. We, we want to share this process with other producers. We want other producers to be successful and more profitable and, and to keep, keep the farms that we have. Um, number eight is just a, a kind of a research aspect of the project, which, which you know, we have a strong interest in as well. And, and we want to monitor the effects of, of converting marginal lands um, on soil health. Part of this is developing long-term case studies, um, really to look at the impact of, of these perennials on farm profitability, but, but also to uh, number 10 there, it, it, to, it to hopefully influence policymakers in some day to change the things, the policies that are, that are causing um, our current land management um, system. And uh, of course, this, this program is an uh, investment by all the entities involved uh, to help get that ball rolling in the future. Of course, uh, other outcomes and benefits, you know, I mentioned the profitability. Um, there could be an impact on long-term insurance coverage on the remaining cropland acres, the most productive cropland acres. Um, <clears throat> we have a lot of evidence that shows that the yield on those acres is increased because we don't have the poor areas dragging down the good areas. And so when a 2012 would happen or a 2019, the level of coverage on the good cropland, the cropland that's farmed should be higher. That, that is what we're trying to say there. Of course, soil health is going to be vastly improved on these marginal acres. Uh, that's going to affect water quality. And it's going to increase wildlife habitat. And, uh, and that, that is so important. And so the educational opportunity, I think, that we are creating is, is, is impactful in that we need the same message coming from our wildlife, our natural resource students, our agronomy students, our engineering precision ag students, and our farm management and economics advisors. Um, we all have to be on the same page as how we deal with these marginal lands. We promote a working lands concept uh, where there is a lot of flexibility. Uh, there are a few constraints or rules that we, we'd like producers to follow, but, but by and large, that means a hoof or a cow or a sheep or whatever, you know, at any time on these acres. And, uh, and so that makes it a little bit different than, than some of the other programs, which are just fine if it fits the farmer's situation. And eventually, this, this will impact uh, reliance on farm program funding, such as the subsidy for crop insurance. Uh, South Dakota and North Dakota are leading the way in, in insurance claims. And um, I've become aware that Crop insurance can refuse to cover uh, acres that continually, you know, claim, have a claim. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, and so this could be coming in the future. I think this is a proactive way to, to change that. And of course, lastly, you know, we always have to be concerned about, you know, other stakeholders, non-ag stakeholders, and uh, this type of uh, management concept, I think, can go a long way of increasing their confidence in our system. So these are all wins, obviously, and uh, and we think we think it's a great program. So just looking at the every acre counts portion of this, if a producer went through precision profitability analysis and said that you know they wanted to put some acres in a program, every acre counts portion of that offers. Um, 
you know, that ability to do that, uh, it's based on five years. Um, there's a, a payment of a, a total of $150 per acre uh, paid out. So not a lot, um, you know, in most cases covers the taxes and maybe um, any weed control expenses or anything like that. Um, we use the data, of course, to identify those land areas. The producer decides how much to enroll. There's no uh, obligation at all to enroll any land at anything by giving us the opportunity to do the precision profitability analysis. Uh, we will, we do that for free through these grants. Um, every acre counts would provide $50 for seeding, uh, which is similar to other programs. Other programs may have slightly higher than that. Uh, we're not about easements, um, but of course that's the landowner or producers, you know, decision on their own um to do that if they want to again i mentioned it's a working lands focus um grazing is allowed all year uh the harvesting the forage is permitted outside of the primary nesting season so after about august 1st and then hunting is not regulated by any program it's totally controlled by the producer and the landowner and there is again no obligation uh, for letting us do the precision profitability analysis for you. Um, I, I just want to make that clear. So, uh, as I mentioned, we don't care what program it goes into. Here's some examples of other programs. Uh, SHHP, I mentioned, there's CRP. Uh, there's some equip uh, enhancements, could be CSP as well. There could be others. And uh, they all provide benefits. And, and there's a picture of uh, uh, some salty marginal land that's just been seeded. Um, you can see the rows there of the perennials that are growing and you can see the weeds. Uh, the kochia is, is, is coming along fine. Uh, it, it progresses that way and, and uh, eventually it, uh, you know, it, it, it develops quite well. So the precision profitability planning process is, is you know, understanding the operation. Uh, do they have livestock? Don't they have livestock? Uh, do they need to graze or don't they? All those things. Uh, getting to know the farm. Uh, then we connect to the data. We analyze the operation. We talk about the op options. And then if the producer wants to plan and implement them, uh, that would be the last, the last step. Um, confidentiality is a big deal on our project. Uh, we're essentially looking into um, a farmer's checkbook. Um, not any of us would want any, any of us to look in checkbooks uh, of each other. So um, we just want uh, producers to know that, that very few people are going to be seeing their data. Now we will want to aggregate uh, the data with other producers together to write those case studies that I mentioned. Um, you know, so, but there will never be a time when a name is associated with a piece of data. Um, now I'm going to share some data, some fields, but we've got permission to do that. So if producers are willing to share, uh, we, we do do that. So connecting to the data, we've got all of these precision farming platforms um, where data is stored. Uh, had one producer where data was stored on three different platforms. Uh, think about producers trading combines and getting a new combine. Um, think about all those interactions that can happen. And, uh, and so Kristen is really good at making uh, this is where she comes in, <laughs> getting that data from all these platforms into, into the software we use. It's called Fieldalytics. We're not uh, endorsing that, but it gives us the highest level of analysis that, that we feel that we need to do our job. Here's just a little picture of, of some of the expense data that, that we can put in. Uh, we've had producers just give us a total. And that, that's fine as well. Uh, we've had producers give us all of their variable costs and withhold the land cost. 
and that's just fine too. Uh, we're very easy to work with, and um, uh, but the results or our analysis are only as good as the data provided, of course. And so we have decisions with our producers about that, and and you know each farm is really different. So what we do is take multiple years of harvest data. Um, that's that graphic on the left representing that. Uh, it could be corn and soybeans, wheat, sunflower data, uh, barley. I mean, any type of yield data. And, and we <clears throat> even work with producers that don't have data. If they're comfortable with us using satellite imagery and then using their yield, you know, their average yield for the field to apply back to the zones we create from that imagery, uh, we're, we'll do that. And um, I think that's important because the, the imagery is getting so much better in the mathematical uh, process for identifying uh, imagery that correlates well with other imagery is, is really good right now. So what we create eventually is a normalized yield map on the right-hand side there. And so that's, an, if you will, an average of all of those years of, of, of yield uh, data, yield maps. And, and so we create these zones, productivity zones, and then, then apply the yield back to those zones and do the economics um, uh, on that, that yield variability. So here's a real life example of a field. Um, that we've analyzed. Of course, the name isn't on there, but uh, we are allowed to use the field data. Um, on the left-hand side is the precision profitability uh, right from the get-go. And you can see that there's uh, uh, those orange areas are unprofitable um, up in that $200 range. So we roughly have about oh, six to 9% of this field that's in a, in a negative uh, you know, profitability area. And then on the right, Kristen um, just uh, uses her farm knowledge to just say, what would it look like if we took these areas out? And she's taken out those two areas that are encircled in red and, um, and then redoes the analysis to show the comparison. What would happen if, if you no longer farm these, farm these areas? And so we can see the yield. If we look at the tables below the graphics there, the yield uh, of the field was uh, about 199. And when we took those, those small areas out, about 8.4 acres, the yield on the rest of the field is um, not quite 210 bushels. So instead of reporting the, one, the 199 uh, on your insurance paper, you would now be reporting. Uh, the 210. And over time, that should have a positive impact on, on coverage. Um, of course, the return on investments improved. The opportunity ratio has gone down. The opportunity ratio is those approximately those acres where um, it might be a, a, an advantage to uh, do something different, to either cut costs, increase productivity, or like we're uh, promoting here, just take it out of crop production. The profit on the field actually has gone up in this scenario. Um, you can see it's gone up about $600 without farming those eight and a half acres. Um, and the break-even price has improved as well uh, because we're more efficient on those bushels uh, from those acres that aren't uh, losing any money. So I, I think this is a good thing. And um, um, I guess on the right-hand side table there are, is the overall difference between the two comparisons. I think the big thing that I like to highlight is the total expenses have gone down by almost $4,000. So you can take that to the bank. And um, just think of a lender uh, looking at this and saying, you mean I'm only loaning you money on your least risky acres? Um, I would think bankers would want to uh, uh, shed risk as 
quickly or, you know, as easily as they can. And I think this is a good example of, of possibly shedding that risk. Do the same thing with soybeans. Um, we're not, uh, we're not fixated on, on corn. Uh, we just chose corn as a common crop across our state. But if a producer wants us to do other crops for the farm and, and apply to that normalized yield map, absolutely, we, we will do that. And you can see those comparisons here as well. Um, I think you would agree that it's, it's, still, it's still positive in the thing to do. This does include the, uh, the profit from a $30 per acre payment on those acres that we took out. So here's another real life situation. Um, uh, this is a half section. This is uh, 320 acres. Um, you can see on the left, uh, all of the orange and yellow areas. Those are the, the uh, negative profitability areas. Um, you know, there's, there's uh, quite a few acres in this field. And uh, the farmer uh, decided where to draw these lines. Uh, this isn't an example that Kristen would have created, but uh, they just decided where to draw these lines. And uh, so you can see that on the right, how much of that field has been removed from crop production. It's 136 acres. And uh, you can see the improvements in the yield. The field was averaging uh, about 133, and now it's up to 149. Uh, the return on investment has uh, drastically improved. Uh, we've reduced the opportunity ratio down to 7%. So there is still some acres out there, uh, but it's all about doing, doing the farming practices, you know, in, a, in, in an easy, efficient way. And so, yeah, they could have taken out way more acres, but, but they had to be comfortable with what they took out. And, and I think that's what's so great about this program is the, the producer draws the lines. And uh, I always advise that they draw the lines based upon their sprayer or their planter width or, you know, whatever practice in their system that they want to uh, develop that border by. And uh, so it, it's really... It's really good that they do that. Um, the profit on this field has gone down from about 40,000 to 36, 36,000. But just think we've taken out 136 acres. But look at what happened to the total expenses. They were spending almost 103,000 in input costs on that field. And now they're down to 57,000. So that's reflected in the ROI course and uh and the impact on the break even is is really decent there as well um there was a 16 bushel increase uh on the remaining acres and now that that doesn't mean that the yield actually increased on those acres those acres aren't being dragged down uh by those poor poor yielding yielding acres so i think this is really impactful we get a lot of attention when we show uh, data analysis like this. Here's an example of the field report card uh, that Christian creates. Um, of course, up up in the top is the is the yield of the field, the yield distribution. Uh, then we have the profitability distribution below that. Uh, the return on investment to the right of that, um, and then a couple different scenarios to kind of think about is. The yield increase needed um, on acres to bring it to break even. And you can see there, you know, you can kind of think about that. Is it possible to increase the yields on those acres uh, by that amount? And then, or the expense reduction that's needed on those acres. So uh, basically there on the lower right side, there's a great portion of those acres that need above a $75 expense reduction just to bring them to break even. So we're talking about taking out the fertility program or the weed control program. Uh, certainly we can't take the seed out, but uh, we're talking about some drastic expense reductions just to break, break even on, on a lot of parts of that field. 
So I want to just a few moments here, talk about a project that Nick Ulk on uh, our campus, he's a precision um, um, uh, instructor. Uh, So works with students. That's all he does. That's his job. And so um, Pheasants Forever really um, supported this process way back and had a small grant on campus for students to get involved with and take a course. And uh, they actually did this um, some years ago. And so I just wanted to show that what they what they did. Uh, they had a quarter section here in, in Kingsbury County to work with. And there there's the soil soil types on that field. Uh, they did the profitability analysis with the producer who uh, uh, was willing to give give the class his data. Uh, very open to that. Um, a lifelong learning is a, is, a, is a great decision for anyone to make. Uh, but here you can see that those unprofitable areas around that, um, you know, that wetland, that, that water body in the middle of the field and in the lower uh, corner corners there, there's some unprofitable areas. And uh, so they found that only 92% of that field was profitable. And uh, so taking some of those areas out uh, involved this, this graphic here. And you can see it's nothing more than just buffer strips, just areas along that wetland and in that southwest corner. And you can see they straighten those lines up and uh, to make it easier to plant and, and to, you know, to get those cropping f- practices done in the field. And uh, so they improved the situation um, on this field as well. And the farmer um, did install those practices. Um, they went from an average yield of about 180 to 187, These comparing these two tables here. Of course, again, the same old stories I've showed you already. Profit is uh, positively impacted. Break even is, is going down, which is good. Uh, it makes the ability to make even more profit on those remaining bushels uh, easier to do. Uh, of course, those expenses went down. Um, the total revenue also went down in this field, but but we brought the field from a slightly negative profitability to to something that's pretty respectable. And so, again, another great example of a class of students, a very diverse class. Um, it had all of those groups that I mentioned before, the wildlife, the agronomy, the, the precision ag engineering people, uh, and, and the economics people, students in that class. So anyway, really good, um, good comparison there as well. Here's some more real farm analysis. Um, um, again, you don't know this producer or even where this is at. Um, but this is real, real data of 11 fields on this farm, totaling up to about 880 acres. Um, we did a little something different here. Um, you know, we're, we're learning, uh, we're discovering how to share data, how to present data, and which way is most impactful, um, you know, to have the biggest impact in our educational process. Um, so here we just divided divided out the profit categories and, and then the amount of acres that are in the break even. And then, the, and then we have the loss categories there. So possibly could a producer say, well, I want to focus on, on everything that I lost a hundred dollars and more on. Cause I think that $50 range of loss is, you know, you know, maybe some years that could go into the yellow or even the green. Um, it it kind of just depends on how, what a person or a producer is comfortable with. But in the end, um, over on the right-hand side, the probably the, the biggest impactful number that there is for this 880 acres is that there's almost $73,000 of expenses on this farm that one could really say are essentially just going down the drain. Um, dragging the operation backwards. 
Now there's whole all kinds of implications of that seventy three thousand dollars. There's interest on that money. Uh, that's a decent salary. That's 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 a higher salary than than ninety nine percent of the world makes. Uh, if you look at it that way, uh, that's that's decent money. That's almost eighty three dollars per acre of every acre that that those unprofitable acres are are drawing down the farm. Um, so I don't know how we can ignore this. Um, I think, I, I think this, 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 uh, work is gaining momentum. Uh, it took a number of years to, you know, get a working program and, and get going in a direction that, that was good and, and better and improving. And, and, and we are now, and I think, I think it's just going to keep, uh, keep growing. Um, and we, our hope is to have this become a common practice, precision profitability analysis. We just, we just hope it would. Um, next, I just want to share kind of where we're at with the program. We're at about 41,000 acres. These, these numbers are changing almost daily. <clears throat> so we've, completed uh, um, 26,000 acres of analysis. We have, of course, acres that are in progress. And of course, data is coming in. We don't get all of the data all one time. We get the yield data um, and Kristen starts working on that. And then the producers start working on their economic data and that starts rolling in. And so we're, we're at all stages of this process with, with many different producers. And currently, we're at about 1,500 acres enrolled in, in some sort of conservation program. And there's about four to 500 waiting, you know, in the wings to go in. So, um, so I think uh, you can see that, that this is successful. Um, uh, this is a good, good process. And if, if you're interested or have a producer... Uh, that you know that's interested, uh, please point them our way. Um, we want to hire more Christians. We want to find more grant money. We want to convert more acres. We want to just do this process on more and more acres. Okay, lastly, I want to get to the carbon. I got carbon payments here. Um, you know, maybe I shouldn't have put that there. <laughs> um I'm not really going to propose any type of payments. Um, it's definitely something to think about. Um, I had the opportunity to look at a lot of on-farm data. Um, this uh, data I'm going to show you represents about 13 farms, 6,200 samples over a 15-year period. Um, and so what I did is I broke out my uh, soil samples into the categories. Um, so this, this graph is soils without issues. So non-marginal lands shown in this, in this graphic. And so what I did is I looked at uh, an individual farms data, individual field data. And frankly, these are from actual zones within fields. So, so really soil types. And I was able to work with the agronomist that gave me this data and put a name. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm having problems this morning, but put a name on those zones, a soil type, if you will. And so the common um, theme that I could find across all of these samples was a soil productivity rating. So by, able, by being able to put a name on that zone, I was able to, to get a soil productivity rating. There are state level soil productivity ratings, usually for um, taxes. There are county level ratings, but there is a table for the whole state. And so that's the table I used. Um, you know, the art of, 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 of sharing data with other people is putting it in, in a way that hopefully that they can understand. And so, you know, graphical is, 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 is the best, I think. Um, so here we have productivity rating across the x-axis. Uh, 
And we have the amount of soil organic carbon in pounds per acre that has changed during that sample time period. Okay. And that that's about 15 years. Some fields could have been 10, some could have been 15 or in between, but about 15 years. And so that changed from the beginning to the end. And, and so we can see here that it plots very well with productivity rating. So those soils that are more highly productive are contributing, are, are going up in carbon, but our less productive soils are, are losing carbon. And so these are in the soil category that I called soils without issues. Okay. So at about 60 to 65 productivity rating, we're in a positive carbon area and below we're still, this data would suggest we're still in a negative area. So there's opportunities to, to improve practices to improve this situation, okay? And could that lead to a carbon payment? I'm not, I'm not here to talk about that today, but but to provoke, provoke thoughts, uh, you know, kind of in that way. These are the coarse textured soils that I found um, in the data set. Um, same story, more higher productivity, higher uh, carbon sequestration rates, lower productivity. Hey, we're losing carbon. Um, and I had two points there that stuck out like a sore thumb and, and, um, uh, I did some more digging into the data as to why that could have been. And I, um, I categorized the, the 13 farms as, as adequate fertility, nitrogen fertility program, trying to stretch their fertility program. So lower than what usually is used and then, and then higher. Okay. And I was, I was able to get that qualitative data from the agronomist because the agronomist is working with these producers on a daily basis almost on their on their you know fertilizer application rates and so these two points came out as lower rates of fertilizer nitrogen so they were trying to stretch their fertilizer dollar the most. And so what I'm saying is that affected productivity and that is why those two points aren't in uh, they're not up in the rest of the group okay so it's about productivity and biomass accumulation biomass meaning the amount of stover and roots there that it took to grow a high yielding crop these are our wetland soils and again same same trend same trend um those soil wetland soils that uh that have uh, higher productivity ratings are, are still gaining carbon and those with lower are losing. And then lastly, I have our salt affected soils. And <clears throat> this relationship is still kind of challenging my thoughts. Um, I'll, uh, I'll give you what I'm thinking right now is happening. So on a lot of these farms, the uh, salty soils now were once the most productive soils on that farm. And I don't think there's a farmer that's, that's going to argue with me about that. And that is kind of a hindrance at keeping producers from, from putting these salty soils into some program is that there's a hope there that all of a sudden we're going to dry up and then those salts will go down and those will become the most productive soils on that farm again. Okay. And so I think what's happening is this is the salt accumulation effect. Those once very highly productive soils, the salts have come to the surface and now they're not productive anymore. And we're not growing a crop on those soils. And wow, look what's happening. Um, they're, they're not in the negative carbon loss situation, but the trend, okay, of productivity rating is, is inverse to the rest, to the rest of the examples I gave you. And so I think that that's something that we, we can um, make some decisions about. Um, 
That's why a lot of the programs coming out are only five-year commitment. Um, we don't know the future. Nobody knows the future. So, you know, five years, let's get a perennial on those salty, marginal salty areas. Let's, let's assess what's happening at the end of five years. Could it be that they could be farmed again? I think there's a possibility. Um, I really do. If it stays wet, yeah, you could probably take them out and farm them a couple of years until the salt all came back, but it comes back quickly. It comes back very quickly. So that's the end of my slide set. I'm going to summarize a few things here. Um, every acre counts brings consensus among both agricultural and conservation organizations. And I think, I think that's, that's really a powerful statement. Um, Marginal lands are set aside and not farmed. Therefore, it has a positive impact on wildlife habitat. The environmental benefits could be really huge here if, uh, if, if we set aside, you know, 5 to 10% of, of our field areas. Our crop risk coverage could increase. Of course, that, that would directly result on, on a less reliance on taxpayer dollars. Right now, about Two thirds of our crop insurance premium is subsidized by by our government. So anything we can do to reduce that reliance, I think, is so important. And why that is is because everybody likes to eat, right? Let's put this in a big picture. Let's frame this in a big picture. Everybody has a stake in food because we need to eat, right? So. So that's why that relationship was established. But, but anytime we can, we can reduce that reliance, I think is good. Of course, on-farm profitability is improved. It's big. I think it's really big. Possible carbon payments could be established or could be a focus on some of these uh, marginal lands. And then, I, you know, I always think about what our non-ag people are thinking about us. And and so their acceptance, I think, of how we do things and how we manage our, our land to its highest and be best use, I think uh, there isn't anyone that could disagree that that's, that's a good approach. So with that, I'm done. Um, and um, I'd just like to highlight our current supporting partners, uh, of course, the Soil Health Coalition, uh, South Dakota Corn. Uh, Ag Tegra Cooperative, of course, I mentioned Perina, Pheasants Forever, Ducks Unlimited, and South Dakota Game Fish and Parks. So we're always looking for other partners uh, to help us to help us with that. So thank you for for listening today, Anthony. Yep. There is a question in the chat. Okay, let me read it to you. Would there be a way to calculate reduced GHG emissions from marginal land enrolled into every acre counts. Hmm. It seems to me that it would be lowered once it's put into a perennial system. Are you exploring that benefit? Yeah, I, that's a very detailed, um, um, detailed process. Um, can we estimate that? I think we can through models like Comet, the Comet model and others. Um, but if you want to access that direct impact, you know, it takes uh, research projects like Dr. Dave, David Clay's group, and, um, and we call them, um, uh, they have these traps that they place on the soil to actually capture the greenhouse gas. That's very labor intensive. Um, uh, it takes replications, <laughs> and it's a lot of work. So. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Anthony? As you're kind of thinking about them, there is a two question poll. If you'd be so kind to answer that. And then. Should I, I stop my share? Yes. Yep. That way I can show that QR code. So I will get that loaded up for those that need the CCA CEU QR code. 
So be thinking of any questions and drop them in the chat as I'm doing that. Did we go quiet or is everything? Yes, we went quiet. I um, uh, I see the QR code, but I can't get it to share. So I'm retrying it again. So yes, any questions or anything, any other comments that you would have to say would be greatly appreciated at this time. Okay, Matt, do you have anything to say? <laughs> I think just for, uh, um, What's the quickest or easiest way for someone that was interested to get more information or get started? Call you, call me, call Kristen. What are we selling folks? All of the above. All of the above is good. Um, uh, email, of course, phone, um, uh, through Kristen, um, they're, uh, the GF and the South Dakota GF and P are being educated about this. So they're aware of it. You can talk to them who can get us, get you in contact with us. Um, yeah, NRCS obviously knows about the program. Uh, if you're in the ag Tegra area, they, they are our partner. They have supported our program. They, they are fully aware of our program. Um, yeah, just any of those. Don't be afraid to reach out. Um, yes, that that's that's the that's the answer, Matt. Thank you. Hopefully, you all can see that QR code for those that need it. Please pull out your mobile device and open up that CCA app to scan that QR code. Just want to thank you for turning out for this year's crop our webinar series. There will be a survey coming at the end of the week. So if you'd be so inclined to fill that out, we'd greatly appreciate that. And we hope if you're able to join us in Brookings on March 22 for Soy 100, for those of you that are soybean growers, we'd be excited to see you in person. Just give it another moment or so for those that need that QR code. It is for one credit's worth of soil and water. So now is the time to get those credits. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying, Connie. I'm trying. <laughs> See, that's why I'm keeping it open longer here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, shoot. I've and missed then so have. Go ahead. Sorry. No, I'm gonna, again, I was just going to remind that we've got that survey that'll come out at the end of the week. You know, I've kind of mentioned that, but that should be emailed directly to everyone that has participated in the crop hour ser series. But just want to put one last call out for questions since we always have our 4-H and FFA clubs asked three times. You know, for new business and old business. So, any other questions? Any other questions? Just do that last call for questions. If not, again, just want to thank you for your time today and throughout the winter as we've had our different crop hour series. You know, we've enjoyed them and hope you have had as well. So, with that, I'm just going to go ahead and say thank you. Yep. Thanks a lot. Have a good season. <laughs>